that any assessments that we were given to the students that we gave back feedback in a timely manner as well as any mode of questions that were asked of us either if it was in a chat application or via email that we respond within a certain time frame and then for social presence every module contained at least one personal video upload assignment um, had one personal reflection or opinion assignment as well as um, we implemented weekly discussion boards uh, throughout the semester where they um, would then post a response to something, a, a prompt that we gave them, and then they would have to do a minimum of four uh, peer feedbacks. For a complete list of what I've done in it though, the handout that is um, as going with my presentation does give a complete outline of everything that I implemented from the framework in all of the modules. So I ended up being able to recruit 47 students that enrolled in the online course. They were undergraduate kinesiology majors from the university. I had an average age of about 22 years, um, being that it was an introductory course. Most of my students enrolled were freshmen and sophomores. I had a fairly even distribution of men and women participate. And then for my methods, I took three um, Likert scale surveys that measured the three presences, perceived learning, student satisfaction, and sense of community, and merged them into one Qualtrics Qualtr survey that was sent out at three different time periods through the semester. So, when I uh, was examining how the students perceived the community of inquiry framework, I found that the students reported an overall high perception um, of each of the presences across each of the three time periods. A high perception uh, is defined by the authors as having a mean score of three or above. And I had a lowest score of 3.94 uh, for social presence at time three. So all of the time periods when I was collecting the data, the students received, uh, reported a high perception, overall high perception of what we implemented the event. And then when I wanted to look at the change of the perception over time, I, I, found, I ran a one-way ANOVA on each of the three presences and found that there was no statistical differences of the three time periods of the perception of the framework. And then when I looked at more of my third aims, um, looking at examining the relationship of the framework on students' perceptions of sense of community, satisfaction, and learning. I found that social presence had the highest correlation to students' um, perception of satisfaction and as well as sense of community. And this was statistically significant at the 0.001 level. The canonical correlation analysis did not yield um, a significant contribution by teaching presence, cognitive presence, or um, perceived learning. So, based off of what I found, um, overall, the students reported a high perception of the framework as well as a continual perception of the framework. And this may be due to how my colleague um, and I designed and implemented the framework into the course. Again, we took of the course broken into modules and then tried to make sure that with every teaching strategy, pedagogy choice, assessment and task that we implemented, that we were keeping in mind teaching presence, cognitive presence, and or social presence when we were developing that. And similar results were found by Echo and Garrison. Garrison is the main author of the, of the, of the framework. That when they did a similar strategy on their students, they found a high perception and that perception did not change over time. This leads me to recommend that when kinesiology instructors are considering implementing the framework into their courses, that when they are looking at what they're trying to convert an assignment or a teaching uh, practice, that they keep in mind the three presences in that development. Um, there's many different recommendations given in, by the authors and throughout literature on what you could do to convert your courses as well as what you could implement 
to enhance um, any of the presences. I have a list, um, the chart in my handout is doubling as a list of recommendations that I implemented that may uh, be why my students found a high overall perception. And then when I looked at social presence having a strong correlation um, to satisfaction and sense of community, um, I found that when looking back at other literature, that this is not uncommon, that social presence has been seen across many publications as having a strong association with the students reporting a sense of community and having an overall satisfaction in the online course. This allows me to assume that when my students um, took the course, that they were able to uh, project themselves into the virtual environment as a real person and that in doing so this was a valuable and positive experience for them um, in being able to find a sense of belonging and having an overall satisfaction with the course. So I would recommend that when kinesiology instructors are considering um, utilizing different recommendations for enhancing social presence in their classes that they consider utilizing um, different technologies and techniques that facilitate uh, communal discourse. And that's, because that's really what uh, my colleague and I did uh, when we did social presence. We did discussion boards weekly, um, and that's pretty standard for creating social presence and online learning. But we also tried to be creative and utilize technology that's out there that helps facilitate social, um, communal discourse as well as projecting themselves as a real person in the environment. Some of those um, strategies that we used was uh, chat applications that was really, uh, we, thought, we thought that was really effective in not just using that application for the, the group to be able to communicate privately with each other, but we embedded the, them using a the chat application into the actual assignments. And then that allowed us as the instructor to also be on that feed and monitor um, their progress and their work while they were working through the assignment. We also use G Suite tools. So again, Google Docs and Google Presentations that are fairly standard for undergrads to use anyway. But we embedded them as very, very, very structured assignments um, that we would then use for them to have a small group um, presentations or small group assignments. And then um, we use personal video uploads. And my colleague and I found this to be very effective in the students being able to project themselves as a real person. We would have them do um, postural assessments, physical activities, as well as um, personal reflection assignments as video uploads as opposed to doing it as a standard paper submission. And then they could um, upload that into YouTube or into what we use as iLearn Video and present that for the class, and then their peers can watch them doing those activities, the physical education activities, as well as reflection activities, and then respond to each other's um, the work they presented. One way that this research could be strengthened um, is one of the weaknesses is that there really isn't a, a way of quantifying um, high versus low perception statistically. The, the the survey, the Community Inquirer survey, doesn't really yield you the ability to do that, and they just use the mean scores reported. So I would recommend that there needs to be a better way of implementing um, some type of means of fidelity check um, to say, how did I implement effectively each of the presences, and then be able to statistically di di differentiate between a high perception and a low perception by the student. Also, um, qualitative data didn't work out for me um, during this um, study. And I think being able to get some focus group or some interview information, uh, qualitative information, would be able to yield um, more rich data on what was it that I implemented that resonated positively or negatively with the students. And then this would help us as kinesiology instructors when we are considering utilizing this framework and converting our courses to an online or hybrid format to be able to use specific pedagogies that would um, 
that would enhance the three presences so that we can have better practical or better um, better quality and structural design that would make our online courses be more effective and uh, have a more quality experience in our online, uh, in our online courses. And I apologize if you said this time, but um, with the different presence for teaching classes and social, um, I know it was, there was no significant difference. Um, open to P values were marginal at about 0.7 for a few of them. What do you think about the overall trend towards the decline? And yeah. What is <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the things that I was kind of speculating that could be why there was a decline in some of these presences, um, there's a couple of, couple of reasons. Um, there was an overall mean score that was started off really high. So there could have been possibly, if I'm thinking about this from a more statistic standpoint, um, maybe a ceiling kind of effect occurred in the beginning and that there really wasn't much ability for being able to improve on that mean score. Um, but there was a decline and it wasn't necessarily because we did much different. I think the students overall, as the, as the semester started going on, started dropping off in their own presence. Uh, we saw a decrease in the percentage of students that were handing in work. Um, and so, and we would also see a bit of times of students um, occasionally needing to just disappear to focus on other classes. So I'm thinking that maybe there was some effect of just being frustrated and overloaded um, with their semester that kind of caused them to be like, you know, this is an online course, I don't have to be here, and that they kind of just checked out for bits at a time, and that there may have just been some overall negativity that um, may have affected how they report it. So the idea of presence is, um, that help prevent some of that from happening. Exactly. Yeah. Um, curious, like, maybe, maybe you don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. Um, unless you have a previous version. But um, whether it would have at least that buffering, maybe it would drop off less. Um, buffering meaning? Like a buffering effect, meaning that maybe it declines in all courses, but maybe it declines less. Mm -hmm. Right. Because of the presence. You, you can't speculate that from this. And I only had one other study I was able to find that actually looked at all three of the presences in general across time. Most research into the framework just collects it at the end and doesn't really look at trends. Um, sometimes they'll look at one, one of the presences over time periods by implementing different, they're trying to compare, oh, just this implementation versus this implementation seemed to affect, but I didn't really get um, an ability to see, is this normal? Should it be going higher theoretically? Does that impact overall quality experiences? Um, and so I didn't really have anything to compare to in regards to trying to figure out, does it, does, should it be going up, should it be going down, or should it always be consistent? And, and didn't you, your first one is not at day one, isn't it at week four? Yeah. Which is probably another reason that that may be enough time to build it up, but. Yeah, so do week four, 11, and 17. Yeah, I mean, I might have missed something at the beginning as well, mm -hmm. but uh, did, did, how did the students do in the class? Or was it great and how did that compare to other times they've taken it or? Um, Other years, just one that I don't think you've mentioned that, but I might be wrong. Yeah, I didn't really look at grades. Um, I looked at perceived learning, so I didn't actually quantify learning. Did learning occur? Um, and I didn't. We didn't. When I was looking up uh, doing the study, I didn't compare it back to 
the traditional format because the traditional format was so, so different. different that that comparison I wasn't sure it would mean anything. Um, in general, um, that traditional format has about approximately a 10% failure rate uh, for whatever reason. Um, and that here we had about the same. 10% uh, failure rate of, at some point, um, many of the students who failed just stopped taking the class. But those that continue to take the class were able to pass it with a C for us is, is minimum. Anything below a C is, is failing. Um, and most of the students, about 90% of them, got a C or above. But I don't know the exact distribution. No, it's just one that uh, sort of begs the question whether it sort of dropped off and helped yeah. and continue with science. But, I mean, it's good work and it's very interesting. Uh, you, you did mention at the end uh, that perhaps <clears throat> if you did look more in depth or over time, qualitatively or mm -hmm. however, uh, that there might be specific pedagogies that you think you know might be useful in this uh, environment. So do, do, do you have any ideas about those? Uh, have you got thoughts like the next semester, this one? Yeah, so I'm doing it again this semester. It's currently um, sent out the series twice. Um, uh, so we're, we're replicating the, it again because this first semester was a bit of a pilot, I would yeah, say. Sure. Um, we really, really saw um, video uploads of themselves, um, uploading them, um, doing physical activities. Uh, that, that seemed to resonate really well when we looked at the students' um, discussion boards when we would have them in the discussion board upload a video of themselves either performing an activity or expressing their thoughts about the prompt as opposed to writing it out that um, students really enjoyed and had a really more robust response to each other when they could see each other um, as a real person when they did that that was that seemed to be really beneficial and um, the small group assignment that we did that students really put up a fuss about in the beginning, like how is this humanly possible, um, really ended up being great, um, utilizing just really small group, very, very structured small group assignments, utilizing um, G, just G Suite applications, uh, really worked marvelously on being able to get the students to do traditional collaborative work um, in an online environment. They were not expecting that at all. Most of the students we even up receiving some type of email throughout the semester was like, I had no idea I was going to be doing this much work um, or, or have to be speaking to anyone else. Um, but many of them finished off with saying, I'm very excited that we ended up being able to do this. Um, it makes my other online courses was it a group grade? Uh, was it were they just dependent on each other? Had, there was aspects a bit of um, they they had there there were we usually broke it up into trunks of parts, so it was like a scaffold group assignment. Some parts of it was a group grade, um, but then the end result was always an individual score. So there are there were times when they did have to rely on each other, um, but then there were times when their own individual work, um, if it was not done, would not impact the rest of the students. And we we assigned every single student a role um, moving forward, so that there was no argument, no need for them to decide who was going to do what. You knew that this is what you're going to do. Um, this was your you were in charge of this portion. Of group assignment and if it seemed like you weren't going to be able to accomplish that let us know we'll assign it to somebody else and you can just tap out um, so it allowed the students to not be so concerned about you know, if somebody doesn't pull their weight how is that going to affect me thanks so um, good job and good evidence for implementation in the right hand category here so I can kind of see that uh, the presence in those three areas were present in your course. Um, and so then I, I'm thinking about like pedagogy and so things like giving quality feedback is really important. Um, mm -hmm. If students do a discussion board, so that's really good social presence, but is that discussion board 
focus on the content. Um, so are there any ways that you can assure quality in, in addition to, you know, that the, the presence is in the course? How do you think about the pedagogy within the COI model? The quality of each of the presences? Exactly, yes. Yeah, so that uh, was something I was looking at in the literature that um, states that for many of these presences, for, or for most um, implementation of recommended implementations of the presences, it's not necessarily quantity, but there is some aspect of that needs to be in there, um, but it's been more about the quality. Um, and that was something that I struggled with trying to define what is quality implementation of each of these presences. Um, and I did reach out to the uh, community of inquiry organization about um, this issue of like, how do you implement it? How do you know if you're doing it well? And they didn't really have a, an answer for that. Um, they were really just more like, you use your best um, skills, practical skills, professional skills, knowledge that you have to decide whether or not you are really you doing quality teaching presence versus not quality teaching presence. Um, so from a pedagogy standpoint, I guess I would say that to really try and figure out if something, if it was a quality implementation or not, uh, one of the things that I kind of looked at was how the students responded to it. Um, did, did, was there a high percentage of students turning in the work? And what was the quality of the work that I got back? That helped me to kind of see, okay, this didn't work. I need to, on the next assignment, to make some modifications. Maybe they needed a little bit more for the teaching presence. They needed more direct, uh, direct instruction versus less facilitation and trying to find the balance of what my students needed um, from that specific presence. And so I don't know if I could, I'm answering that. Yeah, let me do a quick follow up on <laughs> different topics. But, um, so you taught this previously in a face-to-face -face format. Not me. Or, okay, so you may be familiar with it from another. My, my co, the, the instructor, right. um, my, my colleague, she has about this for like 10 years. So this, I mean, this is a, a rigorous course. You know, this model is rigorous. Um, and sometimes online learning, the reason we do it is for efficiency, so large class sizes. Um, can you speak to the feasibility of doing this? Like what, um, yeah. how much cool. would be too much in terms of class size and, and things like that? Absolutely. Um, so my colleague went into this um, wanting to reduce um, her demand, uh, her teaching demand. She's a lecturer and I'm a lecturer, so um, us to be full time is five courses, uh, which is a lot, that's 15 WT years. Um, and she needed some type of means of reducing that load. So she's like, you know, I heard online is better. And then I came in and she's like, okay, let's do this. And then she realized it's not the case. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> she, spent, uh, she spent more time last semester implementing this than she had ever spent on that course in the traditional format format and, I, and maybe in the beginning of traditional formats you would spend that amount of time but once you kind of got that going you can kind of just kind of go on some autopilot um, but you can't do that um, in online course you can't check out if you want to to be there and uh, you constantly have to be monitoring the chats that, you know we use Google Hangouts, monitoring those Google Hangouts for students progressing. Do they need some intervention? Are they are they um, using proper discourse? Are they starting to fight? Um, and so I think feasibility, it's, she's, it's getting easier for her. This semester when I work with her, and she's like, okay, it's gone down a little bit, but it's still not enough. I need um, teaching assistance. I need class sizes where I'm not we have 70 enrolled in this class. It for one, it's too much. It needs to be something more like one to twenty-five. Otherwise, it it from a feasibility standpoint, 
um, and from an efficiency standpoint, it doesn't really work that way. You need to have those smaller, kind of going back to just basic best practices for online education, is having smaller classes. It's not supposed to be MOOCs. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we can't treat it that way. This won't work as a MOOC. It needs to be a lower student ratio. Yeah. So I'm, I kind of have an opinion that maybe online learning is not um, proficient for undergraduate students, even though like they're used to the technology. And, and most of this is very unofficial. It's just feedback from my undergrads telling me I hate online courses because it requires so much of me. And so what we see at our university is a, a less completion rate because of the less um, the limited self like self skills, like monitoring their own self time. And when I saw your decline, I that's exactly what I thought of is it's their own self discipline and they're kicking out. And so what we're actually seeing isn't reflective of the pedagogy, it's reflective of students and their approach to online education that they might come into an online class and yes i'm so ready to do this and i can get everything done in the first four weeks and then and never do anything again. Again. Check out. Yeah. right and then they get to the middle of it and realize oh i can't check out and then at the end you've just got students that aren't going to complete and so maybe more of a statement than a question of just i wonder what this would look like at say a graduate level as opposed to an undergraduate so I have a couple of things to say about this. All right. So the one, um, there is a, a, a movement in this framework to incorporate a fourth presence, which is called learning presence. Mm -hmm. And learning presence is then to take into account students' self-regulated learning skills. Um, and that um, lower freshman, sophomore students taking a course like this, they're going to mind blown. They're, they're going to have a really difficult time because most of them are going to come in without the self-regulated skills to do this. And that it's recommended, and this is what we did, but again, guilty, saw some a bit of dropout. We, not a lot of dropout, but we had some dropout, um, is that they say, I'm not sure if your department does that, but in the beginning, when you're implementing this framework on particularly undergraduates with low, if you think they're going to have low self-regulated skills, you have to build that aspect into your first concept um, through massive tutorials of just walking them through how does this platform work, the online, how do you navigate this course, where do you check in weekly, um, giving them a calendar. We did a Google calendar that was live um, where we put in there every single day this is what we think you should do. We gave them a schedule. Um, because if they, you ask them to schedule it themselves, which we did, we asked that as an assignment, when do you think you're going to work on this with your other courses, with your work life and your social life? When are you going to do this? And it was amazing. So many of the students left off this class in their own schedule because it wasn't, a, they didn't have to go to it. And we were like, Ah, where's the nine hours for our class? So then we put up a schedule and we said, this is when, you know, this assignment's going to take three hours to complete. When are, this is the day that we say you do this on. Can you find three hours to do this? And uh, so you have to be really organized. We did tutorials for every single technology and application that we used. Um, we monitored them like crazy. Uh, to try it in the, in the um, applications and in the Google Suites um, to make sure they were staying on track. And we, when we saw people start to drop out, we would check in with them and be like, what's going on? Are you checking out? Like, or are you, are you planning on continuing? Like, trying to give them a little bit of motivation. Um, so then there's, there's, that's that learning presence that you would think um, that needs to be made addressed in undergraduate. But in the graduate level, you would think uh, graduates are more self-regulated, theoretically. Um, but the, the study that I referenced um, 
uh, was an actual graduate course. Oh. Um, uh, Echo and Garrison uh, did their education students. They were learning online education, and they were graduate students. And when they um, when they did the study, they also saw a gradual decline. Um, but it had it wasn't statistically significant. So I don't know. What Yeah, get it. Amazing. 
of the first I'm talking about the first sexual. And I was like, it tells you we could here's what you need to do. I'm not gonna look at the front. Here's what it's here. Here's the next week. Then we'll get the front. And I was always like free of that whether it was a professional or um, a value personal evaluation or something. So I'm like, I made a calendar for them. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then she okay, learned that the first time I was a job, I must have been a job. That's not her job. And there's some jobs that are really good. And it's a good question. So. Sometimes I want to say, all right, so at home, you pay your bills, you do all these things, you manage all, you manage your work life, you manage your personal life. That seems like you are. That's why you do that. But when you come into the classroom, and all the assignments you get, you do time for the first time, you forget how to do all these things. So they're like, okay, who's what the yeah. need to regurgitate? Don't think you can do this. Yeah, and so I'm here to just absorb, throw it into me, so that I can then sit down and give it back to you in a standardized test. Yeah. And I don't teach that way. And it frustrates me. Have you ever had a conversation? Maybe your parents uh, strong. They'll have a top of 
and I give them solutions of how they want to address that. When you start to hear it, uh, yeah. And right at the beginning, when I'm saying, you know, oh, yeah. I think one of these, and we put in something that is not on the list, is not necessarily tied to the property. And then when they go to the you know, peer discussion, something like this, it's out of work. But the last session, We were looking at um, different ways to take the IAS or Department of Genesis to look at your activity courses. What courses would naturally lend itself to an online type of one? You know, they could be self regulated. So I walked off on a lot of fitness, those type of courses. Um, and try to create them in an online format so that they would have the lesson plan and everything online and they don't record our You are the most interesting thing I've ever done. You really are. Everything that comes out of your mouth, I'm like, I have no doubt. That's exactly what I have. That's exactly what I have. Really, but you can, and they're like, oh, you can do a video of yourself. I Yeah, I 
exercise, prevention, activities, and never really get much interest in it. We'd get a group in and then they would just kind of fizzle out. So it's always frustrating for me um, why we couldn't get that off the ground and then you have, you know, the next year, three girls from one team with torn ACLs. So that's kind of where this project came from for me. Um, a little more background on ACL. So ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament for the knee. It's one of the major um, knee ligaments, so it helps control some anterior to posterior motion of the femur on the tibia, and it also controls um, rotation 
of those two bones. So it's important, especially in an athletic population. So every year there's over 200,000 ACL injuries just in the United States alone. And if you tear your ACL and you want to remain physically active, especially if you are a young high school person, you're probably going to have to have surgery. Um, and in that situation, you're really looking at basically you've lost a year, pretty much, of your athletic career. If you're in high school, that's a long time. So um, most of these injuries, 70% are non-contact. So you think of a traumatic injury, you think of somebody getting hit in the knee, something like that, in 70% of cases, it's not. It's some type of jumping, running, cutting activity where these injuries are occurring. Um, female athletes are four to six times more likely to suffer one of these injuries. And the teenage years are where most of these injuries are going to occur. So um, there's been a lot of research done on injury prevention programs, and programs have been created that are effective. And generally what they're doing, they're trying to address um, some kind of body mechanics for muscular balance, and they are what's called a multi-component training program. So they're incorporating multiple things in one um, program. So flexibility, plyometric, strength training are all part of these programs. Um, on this slide, these are just four of the major kind of named programs that are out there. There's not one gold standard program, but there's a lot of different programs that have been put out there. Um, some of them are free, some of them have free versions, some of them are commercially sold through DVDs or website videos, um, however, but they're, they're accessible. You get online, you can find them. So they're out there for people to use. And um, see that last step there from 2018. Um, they looked at a wide variety of programs, 51 to 62 percent reduction in the risk of injury if you incorporate some type of multi-component training program. Um, there's been plenty of research on prevention, and we know it works, but there's not been a lot of research on the implementation. And of the thousands of articles on injury prevention, it's only one percent of those articles that have actually talked about how to get them put into place. Um, so basically there's a research to practice gap in the area of injury prevention. We've got all this good research says we know what to do as academics, but it's not getting out into the real world with the people that actually need it. Um, a couple of studies here that have looked at implementation rates, um, look at about 20% of these two groups. Uh, first one, um, Norcross, he looked at um, not just soccer players or soccer coaches, but um, also had basketball in Oregon. And then Joy, they have soccer coaches across all levels of competition, basically from youth up into um, high school. But in those studies and some others, uh, some different barriers. Um, stated for poor adoption, things like um, coaches didn't have the confidence in what they were doing, um, they maybe weren't motivated that it was going to do any good anyway, just kind of pass it off. Um, time, knowledge, those were all things that frequently come up when looking at implementation rates. So in order to address those issues, um, I came up with the following specific aims for my project. First, identify barriers to the implementation of ACL injury prevention programs among high school girls soccer coaches. And secondly, assess coaches' knowledge and attitudes towards the implementation of ACL injury prevention programs. For my methods, I did a survey, um, online survey of high school coaches. And in order to get that survey out, I contacted just about every organization in the state of Pennsylvania and outside of the state of Pennsylvania that I thought could maybe help me distribute this survey. Um, 
a lot of people were interested. Some people could help. Some people could help. Um, some people helped and actually, I think, ended up hurting the process a little bit, getting the survey out by um, kind of mistaking what I was asking and what I wanted them to send on. So I don't have an actual, I don't actually know how many coaches I reached with the survey, but I got 32 responses back. Um, they were um, basically sent an email invitation, had all the information on the study links. Um, that they needed to know. So questions were designed to assess knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and implementation of ACL injury prevention programs. The questions came from two previous studies. I kind of used some of their template, came up with some questions on my own, kind of worked it together, created my own uh, survey. I also collected demographic information, such as age, playing experience, um, coaching, coaching experience, history of injury, um, just other data that I thought might be interesting for this study. I also had open-ended questions at the end so that the coaches could just put things into their own words. I wanted to give them the opportunity to just say whatever was on their mind, what they thought, um, instead of being shoehorned into like a multiple choice type question. And um, lastly, used SPSS to try to tease out some data relationships that would be useful in the future. So results, going right to the statistics, I thought maybe I would find some kind of relationship between coaches that played in college and whether or not they used the A program. I thought maybe previous injury, previous family history, um, education level. I thought I might get some relationship in there somewhere that I could use. Um, going forward, and the numbers I had, I didn't get any relationships, which I was kind of surprised. Um, maybe if I had a bigger example of something would have been teased out, but in the group that I had, I didn't find any group that was more likely one way or the other. Um, they're pretty even split between males and females. Um, we had a wide variety of ages, 20s up into early 70s. Um, the, uh, so it was a pretty wide group. Most coaches had an experience of five years or more up to 20 plus years. So it was a good group, but didn't get any relationships there. Um, coaches did report using injury prevention programs at a rate of 45%. Um, the coaches also stated that they received no formal training on these types of programs. Um, and similarly, they had very little familiarity with those programs that I listed earlier. So I, I had them rate very familiar down to not familiar at all. And most of them, the coaches were not familiar with those programs. The FIFA program was the only one that had greater than 50% of the coaches say that they were familiar with it. And that's probably a little bit of the name. I, I'm not sure how FIFA markets that, but soccer and FIFA are a little bit synonymous, so maybe there's a little more communication from that organization that helps get that around the soccer coaches, but that was the only one that coaches really showed um, familiarity with. Um, looking at what coaches indicated as barriers in their minds, lack of knowledge and time were the most frequent um, barriers according to what the coaches thought. As far as open-ended questions, um, I used these word blocks to kind of pull out the uh, most common words that were coming out of the, the coaches' statements. So, see on the top, um, that was the barriers. I asked the coaches to put, you know, what did they perceive as a barrier? In their own words, and see time kind of stands out in the middle there. Um, some other words you can see: parents, players, knowledge. It's kind of big, so kind of ties in similarly to what the um, multiple choice question showed. On the bottom, um, I was asking for what would they suggest to reduce the barriers. What would help them? to get one of these programs implemented. 
see training stands out there. Um, also, we see some similar words like information, education, clinic. Those all kind of fit that training type of uh, scenario. So, coaches indicate, at least to me, that they feel that they need more training, they need more knowledge on this area. So, a few discussion points. So, the findings suggest that the coaches in Pennsylvania are using these um, programs at a rate that's higher than what we saw in previous studies, um, which which is good. So, um, but like I stated, they're not required to receive any training on these programs. So, um, they're consistently stating lack of knowledge is a barrier to implementation. And then lastly, coaches have expressed a desire for more training but this may not be enough to increase implementation rates significantly. So we've seen instances in the literature where um, coaches are trained. They, you know, they'll take a group, they'll give them um, a course, they'll give them everything they need, and they show a real high interest at the beginning, but then it just kind of fizzles out. So it doesn't necessarily stick. Training isn't going to by itself fix the problem. So a few recommendations based on these findings. Um, so coaches may benefit from increased training opportunities for access to information and multiple programs are available for free, like I said before, that have minimal time investment. So um, several of the programs that I mentioned, they are designed to be used as a warm-up. Warm-up is pretty much general, generally um, accepted practice for a game before practice, teams are doing some kind of warm-up activity. So instead of just some random agility drills and kicking the ball back and forth, they could take that 10 to 15 minutes, implement one of these programs. It hasn't reduced their time of practice, but they've done something that we know is not beneficial. So kind of getting that word out to coaches would be important. Um, organizations such as the PIAA should include information on ACL injuries in their yearly sports medicine guidelines. So the PIAA is the governing body of all high school sports in Pennsylvania. And every year they have a sports medicine board that um, produces a manual for, it's distributed basically to all the schools within the state and has information on concussions and eating disorders and each stroke. And things that are very important, but there's pages on pages of things in there that they feel that are important for coaches and trainers to be aware of. And there's not one line in there about ACL injuries or even just lower body injuries in general. So I thought that was surprising. The board is made up of physicians and PTs and ATCs, and they did not include anything in it. So, That'd be a good first step for that group. Um, and then getting administrators, parents, players, and other stakeholders involved in the process to make it more of a kind of increase the buy-in. Um, it's not just one person trying to do it. Get everyone to kind of see the importance of that um, would really help uh, get these programs going. As far as uh, dissemination, my priority has been local impact from the beginning. So I mentioned the PIAA, um, the Western Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic League. They're like the largest um, sports league within the PIAA. So they cover about 100 schools. That was one of the groups that I contacted um, to help me with the, the uh, survey. And then the Pennsylvania Soccer Coaches Association, they have members from each um, individual conference within the state that would kind of allow this information to kind of be spread out through multiple levels. So I have basically created an executive summary of this um, research to submit to those groups, um, to kind of give them a little more information on what they could be doing. I am lastly planning to submit for the regional conference for the ACSM branch this information out to academics and 
um, people outside and directly involved in sports that can maybe help spread that even further. Uh, just a few slight references and links to a couple of the programs. If anyone would be interested in seeing those programs, basically you can go to those links and the whole thing's right there. It's easy to um, download and have access to. Questions? From a soccer coach's standpoint, um, at the high school level, is there any minimum qualifications that they have to acquire to be a soccer coach? No, not that I'm aware of. They, um, I asked a question similar, you know, you're required to take any um, training or certification. Really, they're not. Um, coaches in Pennsylvania have to take a concussion training, and um, you know, it's basically an online course. They go to a website from the PIAA, they can do an online, there's two separate um, classes they can take, and you know, they probably just have to print a certificate and send it in. But other than that, there's no standard kind of coaching certification or, or license or anything like that in Pennsylvania. important work here. Uh, and as a good soccer coach myself, you know, the club scale, you know, we don't have any of this as a mentor training. I just have to be an athletic trainer as well, so I can cover some of this. But as an athletic trainer, um, I know that I've seen quite a few more moving into the uh, Pennsylvania schools and that sort of thing, as well as working with the clinic. Was there any way to parse out the data how many of those that um, and implemented the program like this, had an athletic trainer there to help them? Um, all I, that was a question I asked. I asked, you know, do you have access to an athletic trainer? Do you have access to a PT, a team physician, a strength coach? All the co everybody had access to an athletic trainer, and most of the coaches that had implemented a program said that they had found out about it from their athletic trainer. So I thought that was good that they were getting some communication there because I, um, in some of the build up to this previously talked to athletic trainers that coaches didn't want to meet. They were like, ah, oh, you're wasting your time talking to him. He doesn't care about injuries or something. So I, I was glad to see that there was, you know, a little uh, cohesion there between those two groups. Might be a good pretty good Pennsylvania Athletic Trainers Association. Greg, um, I don't know a lot about this topic, but I know there's a history of girls having a lack of access to sports and programs associated with that. Um, so I wonder how does this fit into that? Is this an issue where there's a lack of programming appropriate for girls, or is this just a lack of, um, you know, the science on athletic training or, or ACL injury? is not to a point to help address these issue, uh, issues. So can you give us some context around that, um, you know, the issue of girls' participation in sports? Well, um, girls' participation in sports has been increasing you know, over the last 30 years. Um, so um, part of the increase in numbers is definitely due to the increase in the number of participants. Um, but I don't know that there's any lack of access to anything specific to girls at this point. Um, at least from a academic perspective, everybody kind of seems to know that girls are more likely. Um, the coaches in this survey seem to recommend. I didn't ask specifically if they knew girls were more at risk, but I asked them if they knew um, or if they felt like injury prevention was part of their responsibility. And I think most of them did agree that as the head coach, they kind of held some responsibility for that. Um, so I don't know what, I don't know if girls specifically has anything to do with why the programs aren't being implemented. Because I think it, you, I'm looking specifically at girls coaches just because I feel like that's where um, you know, they, they have the higher risk in general. But boys, there's a lot of work for um, men's, women's, boys, soccer as well, so. 
Can I just ask the Christian Jump survey? Um, because you know, it's your main source of data. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very obviously very interesting study, very important to get this information. Did you, I mean, did you have a response rate? I mean, you know, you said you got 32 back. Do you have any idea of how many actually went out there or got out there? No, because basically I had some of the groups I had an intermediary, so I couldn't have direct access to the email addresses for all the coaches. So. I was in contact with the lead director, and he basically forwarded on to all the athletic directors in his conference, and then they forwarded it on to the coaches. So there was multiple levels of um, separation between me and the coaches in a lot of cases. Um, the Soccer's Coach Association, they did give me a list of emails to use, but um, I didn't have I didn't I kept everything anonymous so I didn't have any way to separate out which group was responding to which invitation so I wish I had that information but because they basically separated me out from the, the final invitation I don't have any idea how many coaches actually got the survey and then in terms of the survey uh, did you meet, were you able to carry out any you know, content quality or face quality related to the questions that you use. Are there other uh, models out there? I don't know the area. Um, I I just kind of I used the two previous studies that I mentioned earlier. I kind of pulled questions from them. Um, used a couple other articles that had similar types of questionnaires, and then. Um, came up with just ideas that I had on my own between that and um, reviews with the uh, committee kind of came up with a questionnaire that way. So, I mean, did you refer to other con I mean, content experts? I mean, could you, uh, you Outside of this room now. Of your coaches said that prevention is my responsibility. Most of the respondents carried on that side of the Do you think that affected your results? Given that was the orientation of the coaches that responded. Yeah, I, I think it definitely could. I mean, even in probably the coaches that maybe were more likely to respond to the survey were more likely to use the program to begin with. Um, you know, there's always that bias of people that are likely to. Oh, AC, I'll click. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Um, so, but there were still 55% of people that hadn't implemented the program. So, um, I think it's possible, but it could go either way. So, I asked another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm new here. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, as a result, um, with regard to, well, let me ask you this question because this is, I think, the moment my curiosity. We're going to make the czar of the um, Intercollegiate Athletic Association in Pennsylvania. How are you going to enact? Because obviously you see value in the injury prevention program. That's why you're doing this. If you held the power, how would you, given what you learned from this project, how would you move this information forward to put it? into implementation to get these things in the hands of people that will implement them. Yeah, I think um, I would at a minimum basically just require some additional training for, for coaches. Um, one thing I, I wish I would have asked was what do coaches, if you think about high school coaches, that's probably not their full-time job. So I wish I would have asked what is your job aside from coaching? And you know, you probably would see anything from teachers to bankers to doctors, whatever. It's just a random. But I would have liked to have seen that. Um, so basically, what my point is, these people need some kind of training aside from yeah, I learned I played soccer in high school or college. That's how I learned everything I need to know. So you know, they big buzz over the last few years has been concussions, and all coaches are now required to take a concussion training. Um, it wouldn't be that difficult to add in. It didn't have, wouldn't have to necessarily be 
uh, selected ACLs, but you could just kind of a general injury prevention piece in general. Um, you know, they can just do an online training or some kind of initial course, something prior to coaching. So that would be one kind of wave the magic wand type thing. Just have them be required to do something before they actually take the field. So why did concussion get that? I don't want to say stats, but that ability where they had to have some sort of training. Um, well, I, I, the media jumped on it. You know, you're talking about football. It's the NFL. It's big money. Um, and then you're talking about well, kids and brain injuries and potentially lifelong um, you know, repercussions from that. I think one of the issues with other types of injuries is you see the guy that gets his knee surgery playing football and he's back in two weeks. And to the layperson, they don't necessarily understand what that guy actually had done. Um, or the long-term ramifications. Or the long-term ramifications. So, um, you know, I you see, talk to people at, in the clinic, and, you know, if they've torn their ACL, they're probably going to have early arthritis. They're probably going to end up with a knee replacement. They don't really realize that, and they're not thinking about that when they're 17 years old. Their parents probably aren't thinking about that either. They're thinking about college scholarships or even just finishing and being able to play their senior year. So I think the, the level of seriousness of this type of injury isn't being conveyed on the same level as brain injury. That's exactly right. I think it's, so it kind of goes back to your Sorry, Jason was talking about the athletic. Do you think that coaches are the right people to do the injury prevention? Do you think you can affect change through the coaches association or where do you think you can more affect change in the system? Well, one of the I mean, coaches coaches basically are the manager of the team. They're controlling the time. And um, I think they're kind of that first line. The coaches don't necessarily want people coming in and telling them what to do. So if, yeah, if they don't work well with the athletic trainer, they're just going to tune them out and stay on a practice tip. So I think having the coaches, at least at the first line, um, is one way to go. And that's helped you. Because um, I'm coming from an athletic training background, they do, not every high school has an athletic trainer. So if you try to put that on athletic trainers to do, they might not necessarily want that time to work with salary because football might be the priority, but they just might not help us with that because it's not mandatory, it's not information. So the school districts, I, I have a point, just going to finish my point, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, it feels yeah. exactly what you're talking about there. So where in the school systems does change begin? Uh, that's a good question. Parents. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let him answer. So where in the school parents, system is changing? Parents. Oh. You know, parents need to, once the parents start complaining, that's when things happen. So, so coming in from a public health perspective, yeah. the populace being like, we need to do something because I'm worried about my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So that I don't have the exact method that I want to do that, but somehow I want to get parents involved whether it's a pre-team meeting, pre-season, everybody comes in from the athletic director to the coach to the parents. It, you know, it doesn't have to be more than a one-time thing, but if you can get them there and show them the stats, maybe they'll buy in. Um, that's kind of what I'm leaning towards right now. But. Show them a picture of Ralph Sierra for me at 25. I'll have soccer in 16. Mm -hmm. Show up to Can you guys help us with 
up. You don't have to put the tables away, but it's like chairs. You can help put this stuff in. It's all around. <laughs> Think if you were cleaning up your house or whatever, you put some of that away. That would be helpful. 